Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're now getting to the first three minutes of the universe. This lecture is, of course, based off of, I'm totally stealing the name of Steven Weinberg's book, great book, The First Three Minutes, but because it is, it's the first three minutes. So you got to go read his book. His book is an amazing, amazing book. But what we're talking about now is we're looking at the elements of the Big Bang that, that led us to the, that predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is part of the Big Bang model, but the Big Bang cosmic microwave background was predicted by nuclear physics experiments in the 40s by people do, working on the bomb. So let's look at what we mean by that, because this is a, a, quite practically, from most cosmologists' perspective, the predictions and the physics associated with the first three minutes of the universe's history are extraordinarily well known. They're extraordinarily well understood. They integrate a lot with what we already know. And so we can actually see some amazing things that occur as a result. All right, so here we go. Big Bang cosmology. We have the, the principles of homogeneity and isotropy. Those things dictate to us that they're that as, as with general relativity and cosmology, general Einstein's relativity actually said that we can apply the laws of physics everywhere. We then observed that there was a redshift, that all galaxies are rushing away from us, which led us to the idea that the universe was smaller long ago, which then led to us some basic thermodynamic arguments that gave us the cosmic microwave background. But then there's an even more important thing. If we go back far enough and compress in time, we get to a point where the universe is so incredibly tiny that it actually and so incredibly hot that maybe it goes back to the point where the universe was as hot as the center of a star. And if that occurred, then there would be nucleosynthesis just like that's occurring inside the sun. And let's see if we can use what we learned about stars here. And the answer is we can. So the hot Big Bang, we can see again that the what we see now is the universe is a cold, low-density place. All the galaxies are getting farther apart. The universe is expanding. It's getting cooler. But in the past, the universe was hotter, smaller, and denser. But is there any direct evidence of this hot, dense, early phase? And the question then becomes, hey, where's this helium coming from? It's a really good question. Remember when we looked about the nature of stars, and we looked at and we looked at the uh, at the Milky Way. We had two different populations of stars. We had population one and population two type stars, and this was really important. We found though that on all the stars, at they had a they had a minimum amount of helium. No star yet observed has less than twenty five percent helium in its atmosphere. Population 1 stars have about 28% and a lot of metals, and so therefore they're later generation stars. So population 1 stars came from older stars going supernovae and depositing their stuff, and that went into clouds and formed new stars. We talked about that a long time ago, yada, yada, yada. So metal poor stars, though, come from the early cosmos. We know that globular clusters have HR diagrams that sit them at about 12, 10 to 12 billion years old. Some of the oldest globular clusters are nearly as old as the universe itself. So where did the helium come from? Where did it come from? It's They've got to be already in the first star. So where did helium come from is the exact question we're after. All right. So we now know that the universe has lots of different kinds of particles. Uh, we have hydrogen in the upper left, which is a proton with an orbit, a neutron around, with an orbiting electron. So we've got hydrogen, one, one hydrogen is basically it's got a proton, and it's got a mass of one, it's got one proton and no neutrons. A free proton is just all by itself. It doesn't have an electron orbiting it. And electrons, they're free, they can be ionized too. So protons and electrons don't have to be in atoms, they can be ionized. If you have heavy hydrogen, there's a proton and a neutron. And if it's an atomic heavy hydrogen, the electron is in the ground state orbiting it. That's H2 over one. And so that is heavy hydrogen with two particles in the nucleus, and one of them is a hydrogen atom. So one of them is a proton, so therefore it's hydrogen. Uh, now if we, look at, uh, the, if we look at light helium, it has two protons in the nucleus, 
and it has one neutron. And so it's called light helium, and it's got two protons in there, but three total particles. And it, because it's got two protons, it can attract two electrons. And we got photons there bouncing around to do the ionization and just say, hey, uh, would you like some light? And we've got helium nuclei with four objects in the core in their, in their nuclei and two electrons orbiting them. Universe has got particles. It's got neutrons, it's got protons, it's got quarks, it's got photons, it's got electrons, it's got tons of different kinds of particles. And st the standard model of particle physics tells us that together with the six quarks, their force carriers, and all the leptons, they make up all the matter of the universe. So the standard model of particle physics that's been that, that, that people have been doing on the side, this is not astronomy, now we're talking about particle physics. Standard model of particle physics says that there are six objects called quarks, and six leptons, that one for kind of each of the quarks, kind of, sort of, and then four, sort of, four particles that carry forces. So let's look at those in each of the particular things. Our first thing we look at are what are called quarks. And quarks are fundamental particles. They make up protons and neutrons, and which in turn make up nuclei of atoms. So in order to make a proton, you got to have two up quarks and one down quark. Okay, that's kind of weird. And so now we got a neutron, which is two down quarks and one up quark. So what's the difference between an up and a down quark? Well, the mass is a little different for a down quark, as you can see. And the charge is different because the charge on an up quark is two-thirds of a standard charge. But a down quark is a minus one-third charge. So if you have two up quarks, that's four-thirds of a charge. And one down quark minus a third gives you a plus one charge. However, if you have a two down quarks and one up, that's two-thirds minus a third minus a third, so it's neutral, and there we have it. So we have, uh, and then, and the, so yeah, so that what we have then is the series of objects uh, that put together, and these are, uh, and, and these, and that's where we build them from. So a proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark, and that's kind of a funny thing, and yeah, that's our real names, quarks, whatever. And that comes from, I think, Milton, or, or I believe, is that, I believe? Anyway, the next fundamental particle are electrons. They can't be broken down. Fundamental particles can't be broken into little bits. They are unbreakable bits. They're atomic, just in the Greek sense of atomos, meaning indivisible. So finally, we're finding those. So electrons are fundamental particles. They have a charge of negative one. Uh, they have spin one half, and they have a very, very, very light mass compared to quark, to compared to uh, even the quark neighbors above. So they carry a negative charge. Next are photons. They're particles of light, and those are my little photon packets I used in my first lecture. And they go back and forth between the protons and the electrons and so forth. And and how proton and how the charge is transmitted between objects, how electric charge is transmitted, is the transmission of wave packets that are called photons. And so photons are the electromagnetic force. It is the traversing of the photon that is the thing that is the radiative for, uh, the, how, how the electromagnetic force is transmitted. And they're called photons, particles of light. Next we have neutrinos. Neutrinos are arise out, and just very simply, out of the interaction with the weak force. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but suffice it to say that the weak nuclear force is in play whenever neutrinos come in or go out. So when, uh, when a neutron comes along and decays into a proton, as it decays into a proton, one of the down quarks becomes an up quark. Then what happens is, as a result, a neutrino goes away to carry away some of the little, the tiny amount of mass that's associated with it, plus some of the momentum, and an electron pops out in order to take the charge away. The, uh, so that because the neutron is neutral, and the proton has a positive charge, so you've got to have a negative charge in order to make the positive, because you, you don't create charge out of nothing. So the proton because the neutron becomes a proton and an electron. The charge gets divided up between the two of them to keep it neutral and a little bit of the mass gets spun away, and a little bit of momentum gets spun away in a neutrino. And that interaction that allowed that to occur is called the weak nuclear force. The transmogrification of an up quark to a down quark is the weak nuclear force. All right, so now we have the final thing, which is really kind of strange, which is the strong nuclear force, the gluons. And those strong nuclear force says, um, that's a really strong 
charge you got and those quarks, they are going to push against each other. So I'm going to help you keep together. And that's called a gluon. So the strong nuclear force holds the nuclei together. They hold protons next to protons. They hold quarks together inside of the protons. And so they, we never see quarks outside of, of a proton. They're never found free. They're either found in pairs or trios. Um, and so when, when they're in threes, they're called hadron or baryonic matter, or uh, baryonic matter, such as protons and neutrons. And that's where normal matter comes from. They got three quarks. So gluons are strong nuclear force particles that allow protons and neutrons, uh, specifically protons, to, um, to live together inside of a nucleus of an atom. Otherwise, the electromagnetic force, the photons, with the, the charge, would push them apart. And they don't get pushed apart because the gluons are stronger. So the strong nuclear force is much more powerful than the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. All right. Finally, there's something that gives them all mass. And this is a very recent discovery. It was predicted back in the 70s, but it was discovered as part of the Large Hadron Collider announced in 2012 and confirmed in 2013 that the Higgs boson is the thing that gives everything mass. So the thing that we call mass is a particle that's responsible for the masses of all other particles. Now I put the photon in there, but the photon's got no mass. But it rides along. It doesn't interact with the Higgs field. So Higgs particles don't really exist on their own, but there's a Higgs field. And that field is the thing that out of which mass arises, which is kind of a weird way of talking about it. But if you whack stuff hard enough, some of that field becomes particularized, and then you can measure it by how it interacts with other things. So the Higgs boson was confirmed by the Large Hadron Collider in 2012 as an existing thing, and that is a subatomic particle that's part of the, of the part, standard model of particle physics now. And so we have 17 things. I'm just keeping it 16 because I like 4 by 4 blocks, but I put the Higgs on top just because. Higgs is there. So we've got all these particles and we fit them together in various and sundry ways. Things that are made with two quarks, uh, they're, so, they're like muons and so on, things like that. There's all sorts of things that are made by you know, two quarks. Um, uh, but they're, I'm sorry, muons are, are fundamental leptons. But there's, they all have got some funny, funny, funny names. But you can make qu things that have two quarks. You can make things that have three quarks. You can make things that have five quarks. There's all sorts of ways you can fit quarks into things. But leptons don't go along with quarks. They're outside of the quark world, so they stay away from that. But quarks can be, they're never found alone in, the, in ways that leptons can be found alone. So quarks must be found in the presence of other quarks. And so you never see a lone quark walking around going, I'm sorry, where am I? So quarks are always alone. But basically, you can take all these things and interact them together and fit them together like little Lego blocks and build all the other matter in the universe up from quarks and leptons and they're held together by the photon, the, 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 not the photons, but the, by, by the bosons, which are the forces that hold them all together. So the red column is the glue, the quarks make up the heavy stuff, and the leptons make up the lighter stuff. And there we have it. That makes up all the matter in the universe, including dark matter. So if we then go back in time, let's go back to our concept, we say today we see nice and galaxies and everything is all spread apart. But if we go way back in time when everything was, was closer together and hotter and hotter and hotter long ago at the very, very, very close to the beginning of the Big Bang, we find that we go back to our original uh, equation of the nature of how hot the Big Bang is. We then say go back really close to time equals zero. How close can we dare go? to time equals zero. What does that even mean? So if we go back and back and back in time, the universe is hotter and smaller and denser. And at some point we would find that, hey, it's so dense that it's opaque. It's opaque to photons. And we found that at the time, and that's where the cosmic microwave background radiation came from. So let's use this equation again and see, how, uh, and see what the universe has been doing. But if we keep going farther and farther and farther back, we then find that when about 45,000 years after the Big Bang, radiation dominates the energy density of the universe, meaning photons are much more energetic than all other matter combined. And so there is, there are no, at 45,000 years old, uh, before this time, no matter what before this time, there could not possibly be even, uh, there probably weren't many, there were no atoms, no matter what. Too hot, it was on the order of about 10,000 Kelvin on order. So there weren't any atoms at all. 
but there were some nuclei. But there, it was still not hot enough to actually do anything except have a whole bunch of nuclei running around with a whole bunch of electrons and a whole bunch of photons, with the photons having the dominant share of the energy. All right. And when we think about radiation dominated, this is, we go back farther than that. Light carries almost all of the energy. And so we can keep going farther and farther and farther back in time. And the temperature, because radiation density is high, the temperature then gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It also means the universe is expand is, is actually contracting. It will be kind of expanding a little bit faster or contracting faster as we go back back in time because the rate at which the universe size scale is going faster because of the different version of the of the exponential on the bottom of the radiation dominated part so we're ignoring all the stuff with pluses and the energy density according to radiation is the dominant energy density all right let's go back in time until the temperature is equal to about the center of the sun which would be 15 million kelvin how far back do we have to go to get there? Well, we can go back until the universe is only about three minutes old. Well, we, we have a really good understanding of what's going on in the center of the sun. We understand fusion. We understand the processes of fusion. So this is still classical physics going all the way back. And there's no stars. There's no planets. There's no nothing. There's just a bunch of atom, atomic nuclei and a bunch of electrons and a bunch of photons and dark matter going, what am, what am I doing here? And that's what's happening in, the, in that hot cosmos. So it's really simple in a very certain sense. So let's go back when the universe was only three minutes old and the temperature was about 15 million Kelvin so that you can actually have hydrogen fusion into helium. Okay, so let's review it. Go all the way back to our stuff about the sun and the center of the sun and how nuclear fusion worked. Hydrogen was formed as an early thing. So quarks might have formed and then they became nuclear protons. But now you can slap protons together. And if you smack pro enough protons together, you get some deuterium. And because with the weak nuclear force interacting, because it makes an anti-electron, and there's a thing, and that reacts with an electron. It makes more light. And then, the then deuterium smacks into another hydrogen nucleus, and that forms light helium. And that's in an energetic state. The, the, the nucleus would start off in an energetic state and says, and I got way too much energy, so I'll emit a gamma ray. Emit some light. Emit some more light. And eventually, that will collide with another he light helium nucleus and form a uh, heavy helium, and that is part of the proton-proton chain. So when two light helium nuclei collide, they make they end up with a with a helium nucleus, a, a normal helium nucleus, and that. So this happens in the sun at when it's 15 million Kelvin. And if we go back to when the universe was 15 min three minutes old, this also presumably was happening then. So if that happened during the universe's time, it, when it was three minutes old, then how much helium can you get out before the universe cools down, uh, in, uh, before it cools down too much such that you don't get any more helium? So the key, so therefore deuterium is a major key observation for the Big Bang. In the earliest, earliest, earliest times, there was no helium either because it was too hot for even the nuclei to stay together. So you had bare hydrogen, bare protons, bare neutrons. That's all you had prior to about three minutes. And though they were just bouncing around doing stuff and they couldn't stick. It was too hot for them to stick together as nuclei. It was so hot they could not stick, which is a really interesting thought. But once the universe got to be about three minutes old, it had a couple of minutes in or it had a minute or so in order to do nuclear fusion because there was a time when it was too hot before it, and then it was a time after that it was too cool because the universe as it expands cools off. And so how fast can it make that deuterium? And then how fast can the deuterium be eaten up? And maybe there's some leftover deuterium. So as the universe cooled, and it cooled down enough so that it could do fusion, deuterium was formed. Deuterium got eaten really fast because it's easy to do fusion once you can make deuterium. And boom, 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 boom. Therefore, any leftover deuterium we find in the universe must be primordial. If it's out in clouds in space and never has been engaged in, in nuclear fusion, because it'll get eaten up really fast in fusion. So any, fu any deuterium was a product of fusion, 
And if it's floating out in space, it is primordial coming from the Big Bang. All right. So when it's really hot, everything vaporizes, falls apart, melts, unbinds, disintegrates, and goes to the simplest, most symmetric arrangement. What does that mean? It means binding energies. Uh, we, we have to think about the binding energies of objects. I kind of talked about it a little bit. But the binding energies of, of atoms are about 1,000 degrees Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin. And that's where we get things like uh, the uh, emission nebulae, like the Orion Nebula, or the Triffid Nebula, or other things like that, or supernova nebulae remnants and so forth. Those are atomic transitions of electrons jumping up and down. And so if you give it too much energy, the electron jumps away. Fine. So now let's say we have nuclei of atoms. And those are composed of protons and neutrons. So those things are really tiny objects but the nuclei themselves will unbind if you get them to a temperature that's higher than 10 billion degrees because the the light is too is too intense as well as the kinetic collisions between them are so intense that they whack but mostly it's the light and remember it's energy dominated by light so the light there's a lot more light than there are atoms and the nuclei of atoms then plays the biggest, it will be unbound because there's too much light in order to keep them together. And if we go back through, if we get higher and higher temperatures, quarks then become free because the temperatures are too high at about 10 trillion degrees for, the, for, for them to be bound together. So if you get it hotter again, about a thousand times hotter than, than a 10 billion degrees, then protons themselves will fall apart into their constituent quarks. That's what we mean by the binding temperature. Is that the hotter it is, the more it melts, right? So then we can work back and say, okay, we now temp we can think temperature, go back in time, gets hotter, maybe things melt, and then we can say, oh, then run it forward in time, things go from melted state to bound together state. That's what we're gonna do. So the cosmic timeline then says, start hot, go forward, and everything bound, and then things fall into place and bind together. That's what we're gonna do. All right. So in the first microsecond, we had what we would call quark soup. So inside, I'm not even talking about that, but up to, up to the first microsecond, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a lot of hand waving here. So here's my first hand wave. I'm gonna only start with the first microsecond. And in the first microsecond, I'm gonna hopefully get to the other stuff later. And we'll get to that, I hope, later in a later message, which of course we will because we're going to talk about inflationary epoch, which is way before this. But prior to the first microsecond, the temperature well exceeded 10 trillion Kelvin. That means that quarks were free. And quarks not only were free, they were the, the energy of the light was so great that two photons could interact and create quark-antiquark -quark pairs. They could also create electron-antielectron pairs. So there was an absolute balance between up and up quarks and anti-up quarks and down quarks and anti-down quarks, which I've made my anti-things black and my, my normal ones with a white background. Isn't that nice? And so when they collide together, they make a, they have a little bit an explosion, and then that turns into light, and sometimes the photons smack together and they turn into quarks and anti-quark pairs. So there was a balance between the light and the, and the quarks and the light and the electrons. And so up to that moment, it was all in symmetry. A photon couldn't go far without hitting another photon and turning into a, a pair of quarks. A pair of quarks couldn't go far. A quark and an antiquark couldn't go far before they smacked together and turned into light. So antiquark quark pairs would collide and form light, and light would collide together and form quark, antiquark, or electron, anti-electron pairs. So there were like antiparticle particle pairs being created in amazing abundance, and it was all one thing. Basically, because it was like, hey, you got some light, you got some quarks, you got some up-down quarks, you got some anti-quarks and some anti-electrons and electrons. Very hot, too hot for anything else to exist. Universe expands, cools, and then it freezes out. After one microsecond, the temperature cooled, which means that those quark-antiquark -quark equilibrium reactions stop. Now that's done. But the quarks then bind together. So there's, remember, there's a total balance between the quarks and the antiquarks. However, somehow, and it's not understood very well, it's incredibly understood, un, well, uh, poorly understood, 
that somehow there was a tiny amount imbalance between quarks and antiquarks. And so the remaining quarks bound together into the hadrons, mostly particles, uh, hadrons are things with three quarks, and that becomes protons and neutrons. So basically the quarks join together and say, Whoop, okay, now it's cool enough for us to become protons and neutrons, and now they're, they're bound together for all eternity in the future. Up until that moment, there was a balance between those particle-antiparticle pairs and photon pairs. And then all of a sudden there were no free quarks. And we then had, that is where the total number of matter type things, protons, neutrons, and dark matter, all arose at that moment. And then from that moment, the total number of photons was fixed in the universe, and the total number of protons and neutrons was fixed in the universe, as well as electrons and dark matter, which I'm leaving out for the, for the moment. All right. At this point, then, about a tenth out of one, at a very short period by our per standards, but a long period by its standards, one at one tenth, one, one hundredth of a second, the temperature finally dropped to 100 billion Kelvin, <laughs> which is really kind of, you know, still pretty hot. And then the quark antipark quark pair, uh, the, the protons then decouple from the photons, meaning before that it was still so hot that the protons and neutrons and electrons bounced against the photons and they all had the same temperature. So they existed as free particles, meaning they just bounced around and they said, I'm going to, I'm, I'm so hot, I'm going to keep with you. But at some point, the, they, they cooled off enough, the, the nucleons froze out to their own temperature profile, their own thermal profile, and the only thing that could react with them fast are the electrons because the electrons are less massive and so they can interact with the photons and so impart energy to a photon and take energy from a photon very 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 easily and that's because the scatter the the ability of a, an electron to scatter off of a photon is much easier at that point so then the weak nuclear force though says that the neutrinos interact with nucleons so neutrinos stay interacting with them but here's the funny thing, is that uh, neutrinos uh, interact with neutrons. And so the weak nuclear force is still operating to make a balance between the protons and the neutrons at this time. And so there is a balance between the, the, the weak nuclear force, the protons, and the neutrons. So we have an equal number of each at this point. So we've got an equal number, and they're still, it's still too hot for them to do anything. Finally, neutrinos at one second, the weather cools down to below at 10, 10 billion Kelvin, and now the neutrinos then say, and I'm going to just do my own thing because I'll stay hotter than the matter in the, in the matter. Because so they're basically doing their own thing from radiation and normal matter. Radiation still stays pretty hot. Uh, matter is cooler, neutrinos stay between them, and then they can stream out because now they say, well, I think I'm done scattering off of, off of everybody, so, and we're done. So since now neutrinos are scattering and they're no longer interacting with protons and neutrons, free neutrons now start to decay. And as free neutrons start to decay, they live only about 11 minutes, so the race is now on to eat the remaining neutrons before they decay into protons and more neutrinos. They decay quickly, and that's what's going to be happening. After they decay, we have about five, we, we're, when that is done, in less than 11 minutes, we're left, we're very, very, very soon to be done with all the neutrons. And after a minute or so, we're left with one neutron for every five protons. They decay quickly, and that's what we end with in about a minute or so. So, at three minutes old, the universe had finally decreased to about a billion degrees. That means we are left to the beginning of fusion may occur, so or tens of millions of degrees. So now we can start the fusion. Fusion of protons now may occur, meaning it's cool enough for them to stick. And it's, it's cool enough for them to stick, but still hot enough for them to do fusion. And it, the race is on because the temperature's dropping and their energies are dropping. So deuterium forms rapidly, helium forms rapidly, and inside of for three minutes, there's a race between e gobbling up the neutrons by the de deuterium. The deuterium then gets quickly gobbled up, 
by other fusion by by hitting other free protons that forms that that forms a light helium which then forms more helium itself and we're done at the end at the ending we end up with about 75% hydrogen and about 25% helium now the down deuterium is easily burned up in this fusion reaction, so there's tiny amounts left. There's also really tiny amounts of, of light helium left over, extraordinarily small amounts of lithium and beryllium and almost no boron, but nothing else. Nothing bigger than boron. Nothing bigger than that in the entire nuclei, in the entire uh, chemical element table. This is what was made in the Big Bang. Helium and hydrogen. 75% hydrogen, 25% helium and tiny, tiny amounts of, of the other five things that we see there. So, if we look out deep into the universe and look for to the influence of, say, hydrogen, because hydrogen is the most prevalent, and traces of that hydrogen will be deuterium, if we can look for hydrogen clouds and find deuterium evidence in them, we will find the evidence for primordial nucleosynthesis when the universe was only about three minutes old. And that time is way, 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 way back there when the universe was about a billion, about three minutes old, and deuterium and helium were formed about when it was about the billion Kelvin. And so we go way out. And so let's look at the beginning. Here's my hand wavy stuff. I'm going to present this in a new way, new way to present it. The beginning, it was all compact. Less than a second, everything was here. And now, boom, we expand the universe. And the universe expands. At one second old, it was 10 billion kelvins, too hot for nuclei to exist. There were about one neutron for every five protons. And so in my little diagram here, the squiggle lines are, pro are photons. And then the little, little tiny blue things, those are, those are my electrons. The red things are my protons and the gray things are my neutrons. So you can kind of see that there's about, I actually did this, this took a long time uh, to actually do this sequence, so I'm kind of proud of it. So we got a little cartoon going on here. Uh, I got five protons with the five red dots for every one gray dot and there's approximately one blue dot for every red dot to represent the electrons because they're roughly in balance. Now the, elect the photons are energetic enough to keep everybody apart. Eventually, though, it cools off in about two minutes. The temperature drops to a billion degrees. Neutrons immediately form, fuse into the deuterium nuclei, and that's where we see them bound together. The photons have been stretched just a wee bit. And so we've got photons that are still energetic enough in order to keep things, keep, th keep people separated, nothing to see here. But that results in about one de deuterium atom for every, pro of every four protons. So they get absorbed rapidly in this process. Basically, all the deuter all the neutrons get either either decay or become deuterium and that's what's happened by 2 minutes old now by about 4 minutes old the deuterium fuses to form helium nuclei there's some other there's a tiny amount of helium 3 and very 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 lithium beryllium and boron in tiny amounts so by the time the universe was 4 minutes old it had cooled off no more fusion had occurred the light cannot rip it apart, and that left only tiny amounts of trace deuterium, and the trace deuterium is shown all throughout here as the little couples. So in this, in this part of the cartoon, we have helium nuclei, helium-4 nuclei, which are two red dots and two gray dots. That's a normal helium nucleus. The red dots are protons. We've got a deuterium nucleus, which is one red dot and one gray dot on top of each other. That's a nucleus. And we've got some protons in the red nuclei, they didn't, they didn't participate in any of the fun, so darn it, they got left behind. Um, and then you have electrons, which are the blue dots, and the light, which is the green little arrows. So this is the situation at the age of the universe of four minutes, and this is, this is what the universe was. There were no planets, there were no stars, there were no people, there were no structures bigger than a nucleus of an atom. That's what it was. And so as time goes on, after just after four and a half minutes, things were locked in place. Uh, predictions from the nucleosynthesis using our arguments from knowing nucleosynthesis from stars and from nuclear reactions and nuclear physics, we predict that there would be between 20 and 26 percent with, with the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen being approximately uh, 1 percent of 1 percent, up to about 10 percent. So it's a pretty big range. And the actual observations show it's roughly about 22 to 25 percent, the ratio of helium to helium-4 to hydrogen. 
So this is really good. So there's basically four heli hydrogen nuclei for one helium nucleus. That's what that observation shows. That is the prediction from the, from the modeling, and the observations match the predictions. In fact, the deuterium hydrogen, um, deuterium hydrogen observations are much tighter than the predictions, which is really interesting. The predictions can't really give a fantastic prediction for what the deuterium to hydrogen ratio should be, but the observations are even tighter than what the predictions are. All right, so now we go back and days and days and days and weeks happen. After that's done, the universe stayed a lot hotter than 3,000 Kelvin. So this was the situation for a very long time, up until about 200,000 or 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So from about three minutes of age up until the universe was about 360,000 years old, it was a fog of mostly protons and electrons with a smattering of helium nuclei and a smattering of deuterium. And it was a fog where the, where the photons bounced back and forth, scattering off the electrons off and go, and then, they, then the electrons would drag on the other nuclei to keep them all at the same temperature. So the electrons and were at the same temperature as the, as the photons, and the photons kept cooling because of the expansion of the universe, so the entire system cooled and cooled and cooled all at once because they were all scattering off of each other. And eventually, at some point, we had the era epoch of combination or recombination that now the, nuclei, the, the electrons bound to the nuclei to become atoms. So now the electrons finally said, and it's cool enough for me to make an atom, thank you very much. And once they did that, the photons could stream freely because now they didn't have enough energy to ionize the electrons and this is the cause this is this time of the source of the cosmic microwave background all those photons came from the time of the universe when the universe was much much younger and they were a balance of in, if they come from an imbalance of the photons to quarks way back when the universe was a microsecond old and now then, a much longer time, the, the cosmic microwave background gets stretched and stretched and stretched to much, much longer wavelengths. And now we see, instead of it being 3,000 Kelvin, which, was the micro, which would have been the black body at the time of combination, recombination, now it's a temperature of 3 Kelvin black body, and it has not interacted any with anything since then. And so these atoms then from a long time later eventually became stars and planets and galaxies and they fall, fell together by gravity and so forth and so on. The end of the tally after all of it was done at the end of, of nucleosynthesis there was one helium atom for every four hydrogen atoms and one leftover deuterium particle down on the lower right for every hundred hydrogen atoms. So what I did is I put a hundred hydrogen atoms on this little diagram and a bunch of those, but because of the imbalance of quarks and antiquarks at the earliest moments of the cosmos, there are over 10 billion photons for every single particle that exists, every single one. And we're not just talking about, and we're, we're not just talking about the helium nuclei. We're talking every single particle down to the quarks. So the, the, the ratio of, well, well, these particles, actually, at this point, there's 10 billion photons for every one of these normal pieces of normal matter. So photons vastly outnumber the normal of par the, the, the particles. And so you can see why if they, had, if they have the energy, then they're going to really have much higher energy density. But they also get stretched faster by the spreading of the cosmos as the universe expands. So the universe would stretch them into the, inf into the infrared and down into radio. But it doesn't stretch atoms. It only stretches light, which has an actual length associated with it. So that's where we ended up with at nucleosynthesis. And this is a key prediction of the Big Bang. And this key prediction is something that is observationally testable. And the key reactions are not many. We can form hydrogen and new, hyd way down the lower left is the beginning ones where we have hydrogen imbalance with neutrons and we're protons with neutrons and they can form deuterium. They can form heavy hydrogen, really heavy hydrogen or light helium and then form helium. And then there's really, 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 really small numbers that go up from the helium reaction. The, everything above helium-4 is extraordinarily rare, but yet the tiny fractions of them that may have occurred, especially the, the, the step to boron, was uh, were, were also key predictions. So 
what this is, it illustrates all the only chain reactions that can occur inside the circle, inside the red ellipse, that can occur in the Big Bang. We didn't create anything more than that, and the vast majority of it was just the simple little group in the lower left. All right, this leads to amazing predictions, and what you can say is, what in the lower, on this graph was provided by, the abundance graph was provided by uh, Stegman et al., and this comes from the NASA WMAP science team, so you can go look, you can find it there. And for various densities of relative, of normal matter, counts of normal matter relative to photons, where it's very underdense on the left and very overdense on the right, and then you can say, how, what are the element abundances that get predicted by the relative abundance of photons to normal matter as a result of normal nucleosynthesis? And where that nor where the photon abundance comes from, remember, it comes from the quark in quark the quark antiquark imbalance in the early cosmos. So if we measure the the density of matter compared to photons, and what that means is that how much normal matter is there in the cosmos, how much normal dark how much dark matter in there is there in the cosmos, and what is the energy density of photons in the cosmos? And that's exactly what the cosmic microwave background measures by measuring the uh, by measuring the frequency the ampl the uh, temperature fluctuations, and that's exactly what it measures. So the WMAP team pinned it down to the width of that red line which is amazing. The width of the red line is the prediction, is the, is the WMAP observation, is what they observed. And so that pins down what the elementary abund relative elementary abundances should be of all the helium. And so the WMAP observations show, will actually match what is seen in the sky with the helium abundance and the deuterium abundance. So the WMAP observation said, well, this is what we've got for the the red line. The red line is the WMAP observation, the relative abundance of matter to photons, and the green curves are what you get by nucleosynthesis experiment, or by nucleosynthesis predictions by physics. And so then what you do is you go out into the universe and look to see if your theory, the green, blue, green, yellow lines, where they intersect the WMAP observations inside those little circles, does that actually match what is predicted? And if it doesn't, then you've got a problem with your theory. If you don't have a problem with your observation, you'll have a problem with your theory. Funny thing is, though, it matches the theory, matches the observation. So the observation that needs to be matched, meaning the abundance of helium and the abundance of deuterium, is what is seen. So that's what's amazing, is that the ordinary matter has been predicted to have a certain amount of, of, of by nucleosynthesis. Then what's done is said, okay, given that the universe had this amount of stuff, do we think we understand nuclear fusion? If we think we do, then we can predict the total amount of, hydro of helium to hydrogen ratio that gives us the total amount of normal matter roughly in the universe and that also in the co cosmic microwave background is the dominant uh, reservoir of photons in the universe in fact the cosmic microwave background has more photons in it than all the stars in the universe combined so we say how many photons are there compared to normal matter and all of it falls inside the little circles that we see here the actual observations by by checking how much deuterium there is, checking where it is, actually falls exactly where it's predicted, which is astonishing. So how you actually check that is to say, hey, we got this quasar thing. Remember we talked about quasars a while back? They got these really, 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 really bright quasars. And quasars are extraordinarily bright objects from deep, deep, deep in the past. And so their light had to have passed through enormous numbers of clouds of hydrogen on its way to us as it traversed from the ancient, ancient times, when maybe, maybe for 10, like eight or five to 10 billion years of traveling. So as it does so, it emitted huge amounts of ultraviolet light. That ultraviolet light can be absorbed by hydrogen. As it gets absorbed by the hydrogen, some of that hydrogen is deuterium. And so you make a model of the relative abundance of hydrogen and deuterium and see if you can match 
the forest of lines that you get in a quasar. And guess what? They match which is astonishing. So Matt, the, predic the prediction, what you need to do in order to make a model of the hydrogen and deuterium abundances matches what is observed by the cosmic microwave background pr uh, observations that are predicted by pr primordial nucleosynthesis in the first three minutes. So globular clusters contain the most ancient, ancient stars. They do not have anything less than 25% helium. All of the helium that was that is seen in all the most ancient stars of globular clusters, that comes from the Big Bang. That comes from the first three minutes of the universe's existence. So after the epoch of recombination, at 300,000 years or 360,000 years, it drops, and that is where the cosmic background radiation comes from. And we see then that the cosmic microwave background was incredibly important. It has predictions that give us information about the cosmic background radiation itself, encodes the information about the relative abundance of matter to light. The, the amount of matter to light was fixed by the cosmic pri primordial nucleosynthesis. So we go way back in time and we say, star, the, the physics of stars, the nuclear physics of stars, says when the universe had this temperature, it made helium. When it made helium, it only had a little bit of time to do it before it cooled off. How much could be made inside that time, given that the temperature was dictated by just the light, not by the matter, but by the light, the light then said, oh, I'm cooling off now, so now you can't do this anymore, so everybody's going to have to stop. So nucleosynthesis could only occur for just a frat, for a, for a minute or so, a minute and a half, or two minutes, but from minute one to minute four and a half. And then that was fixed, and it was observed in the relative abundance of matter versus light in the cosmic background radiation. So what's interesting is, is after the epoch of recombination, there were no stars. There, for a long time, there were no stars. It's just gas cooling off and cooling off and cooling off. And hydrogen and helium are neutral, so they don't glow. And eventually, the universe was opaque to ultraviolet, and that's where the, the Lyman forest alpha lines that we see in the quasar lines really come from. And then Matter was really falling together because there's nothing to do but, you know, fall together under gravity. And so the matter density really drops uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and in fact, a material becomes stars really fast, becomes quasars. It starts to organize itself rapidly. And then about 300 million years after the Big Bang, you get galaxies. As galaxies start to appear between, say, 300 million years up to about 700 million years. That's the era of the creation of galaxies. And the cosmic microwave background has dropped after about a billion years to 30 Kelvin. And stars had formed, ending the Dark Ages. And those things then reionized the, the, the primordial, uh, primordial uh, in, uh, interstellar hydrogen. And that reionization epoch is also seen in the cosmic microwave background because the photon, the electrons get get hopped up, and that can the that can affect the cosmic microwave background too. So the first quasars form, the first metals are formed by the first supernovae, and then we get our first generation of population two type stars, population one type stars, uh, and then. Population one of the young stars, population two, and the most ancient ones would be the population three stars, which would be being formed during this time. The major piece of evidence we have is the 2010 discovery of one little galaxy, which light comes to us from 480 million years after the Big Bang. And it goes on till today. Uh, well, not, uh, not nucleosynthesis, but the universe expanded and expanded and expanded until the universe was about 2.7 Kelvin, 2.75 Kelvin today. There, we can sum this all up. We have really fantastic evidence for what we call the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a story of how the universe grew. The universe expands. Hubble's law shows that the universe expands. Isotropy and homogeneity are consistent with the cosmological principle. We're not at the center of the universe. That's what we're not. Everything's not expanding away from us. 
the universe is expanding from all points at the same time. And that's the cosmological principle, and Hubble's law shows that. And the age of the universe is consistent with the most ancient, oldest stars. Primordial nucleosynthesis was predicted back in the 1940s when people were doing the initial uh, test for the atom bomb with the, with the Manhattan Project. And they said, well, what would happen if the universe were a star? And they made some predictions, and that prediction led to the idea that there would be nucleosynthesis that then could would have made a background light uh, profile that could be seen today, and that background light profile was the observation of nucleosynthesis. So primordial nucleosynthesis makes hydrogen and helium. It actually takes hydrogen, forms deuterium and helium, and those elementary abundance ratios are determined at the time of nucleosynthesis that also determines what light was and how hot the light was, and that prediction of nucleosynthesis that started from the 40s was then found in 1960s by Penzias and Wilson and refined with greater ease with the COBE, WMAP, and Planck satellites to show that the cosmic microwave background really truly exists. This is amazing empirical confirmation, meaning actual evidence that really exists, that can be taken by other people with money and time, if you wish, that says that the universe began in some extraordinarily hot, dense state 13.8 billion years ago. And this is such settled science that, it, that we actually think it really happened. It, if it didn't happen, if the Big Bang, as I just described it in the last few lectures, did not happen, then something almost identical to it did. So really, uh, they're, they're, the universe is 13.8 billion years. I don't care what creationists say. They're kind of dumb. But hey, we can, well, how can I edit that out? I can't, and I'll just leave it there. So the Big Bang really actually did happen, and these are the major empirical evidences that say it did. And there are some review questions for you to go over because, you know, what the heck. But that's what we're really talking about is the Big Bang and its major piece of evidence, which is the expansion of the universe, primordial nucleosynthesis, and cosmic background radiation. Finally, we're going to be talking about, uh, it will, we'll look at the earliest aspects of the universe because there's some problems with this elementary model, which we call the standard hot Big Bang model. And so there's some extensions to the Big Bang model, which are incredibly important that deal with the earliest epochs of, time, of cosmic time. But this model is very consistent, starting with a microsecond. We pretty much know the physics all the way up to a microsecond of age. Prior to a microsecond, things are a little weird. Things are very weird. We really have a lot of stuff to talk about there. And we have other things we'll talk about with respect to the evolution and formation of galaxies and the formation and growth of cosmic structure with time. So we'll see you next time.